Hey everyone, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Derek Royden. I uh, usually do one of these vlogs a week. I write for a website called nationofchange.org. You should definitely check it out, uh, Progressive News and Views. Uh, and for those of you who've come here before, I'd like to thank you for coming back. It's great. Uh, the response to these videos has been fantastic. So uh, keep coming back when you see that these stories are posted. So uh, for today's story, it's from the Atlantic magazine now. I used to read this magazine a lot when I was younger. Uh, it's kind of it portrays itself as a liberal magazine, but it really has put some of the most illiberal ideas out there into the public. Like uh, they were one of the first places where I read the work of Dinesh D'Souza, who uh, wrote an article called Illib "Illiberal Education," I believe, for the Atlantic in the '90s. Uh, it was one of the kind of first screeds against political correctness, so-called political correctness, and it really went wide through the magazine. Uh, another thing was I believe they were one of the first to publish uh, Samuel Huntington's concept of the clash of civilizations and another, I can't remember who the writer was, another piece that I read back then was uh, uh, Jihad versus McWorld, a really kind of stupid and uh, somewhat racist article comparing different civilizations that's turned out to be entirely uh, untrue over time. So anyway, to get to today's story, it is from that magazine, but it's a really interesting one. It was sent to me actually by a friend of mine named Zeef, whose last name I'm not going to try to pronounce here because I'm sure I will screw it up. Uh, uh, but uh, he has a, a local festival here in Quebec in the eastern townships every summer. Great music and it's uh, an ecologically sustainable festival. Uh, it's, it's incredible actually when you see, if you are there for the whole weekend, you see by the end of the festival there's very little garbage, which is a really good thing because you look at other big events like this and you just see uh, a ton of waste produced. So uh, kudos to him. Uh, I'd like to thank him for sending me the article. If anyone else out there has an article they want to send me, you can just uh, send me through Facebook if you were friends with me on Facebook, or you can send me an email at Derek Royden, D E R E K R O Y D E N, at gmail.com. So today's story is about power and whether power actually causes brain damage in people. It's by uh, Jerry Usim, and uh, the title is Power Causes Brain Damage. How leaders lose, and the, the lead is how leaders lose mental capacities, most notably for reading other people that were essential to their rise. It's a pretty interesting article. I'm, I'm not going to go completely through it. I probably will give more a little bit more opinion today than necessarily going through the article because some of the comparisons they make I don't really like. But you can find a link to the article below. So if you want to read the whole thing, uh, by all means do so. If power were a prescription drug, it would come with a long list of, side, of known side effects. It can intoxicate. It can corrupt. It can even make Henry Kissinger believe that he's sexually magnetic. But can it cause brain damage? When various lawmakers lit into John Strumpf at a congressional hearing last fall, each seemed to find a fresh way to flay the now former CEO of Wells Fargo uh, for failing to stop some 5,000 employees from setting up phony accounts for customers. It was a big scandal with this. Uh, but it was Strump's, perfor or Stump's performance that stood out. Here was a man who had risen to the top of the world's most valuable bank, Yet he seemed utterly unable to read a room. Although he apologized, he didn't appear chastened or remorseful, nor did he seem defiant or smug or even insincere. He looked disoriented, like a jet-lagged space traveler just arrived from planet Stumpf, where deference to him is a natural law and 5,000 a commendably small number. Even the most direct barbs, you have got to be kidding me, Sean Duffy, a uh, congressman from Wisconsin, said. I can't believe some of what I'm hearing here. Gregory Meeks, I assume from New York, I assume a congressman, they might be senators, failed to, make, failed to shake him awake. What was going through Stump's head? New research suggests that the better question may be, what wasn't going through it? The historian Henry, Henry Adams was being metaphorical, not medical, when he described power as a sort of tumor that ends by killing the victim's sympathies. But that's not far from where Dasher Keltner, a psychology professor at UC Berkeley, ended up after years of lab and field experiments. 
Subjects under the influence of power, he found in studies spanning two decades, acted as if they had suffered a traumatic brain injury, becoming more impulsive, less risk-aware, and crucially, less adapt, adept at seeing things from other people's point of view. So you see, the, the left's critique of power has always been this. Um, it builds up a hubris in people. And when people see themselves as, you know, inordinately special or above other people, they almost immediately begin to lose their empathy. And now there's evidence through studies that this is true. Uh, Sukhvinder Obhi, a neuroscientist at McMaster University in Ontario, recently described something similar. Unlike Keltner, who studies behaviors, Obhi studies brains. And when he put the heads of the powerful and the not-so-powerful under a transcranial magnetic stimulation machine, he found that power, in fact, impairs a specific neural process, mirroring, that may be a cornerstone of empathy, which gives a neurological basis to what Keltner has termed the power paradox. Once we have power, we lose some of the capacities we needed to gain it in the first place. And this is precisely the reason to, you know, forward a... a, a less individual-based model, even if we decide to continue with the capitalist system, which I don't think with the current crises we face will survive it, but even if we continue under that, we need to have more sharing of power amongst people, more cooperation over um, hierarchies that put one individual at the top of a pyramid. That last loss in capacity has been demonstrated in various creative ways. A 2006 study asked participants to draw the letter E on their forehead for others to view, a task that requires seeing yourself from an observer's vantage point. Those feeling powerful were three times more likely to draw the E the right way to themselves and backwards to everyone else, which calls to mind George W. Bush, who memory held up the American flag backwards at the 2008 Olympics. Other experiments have shown that powerful people do worse at identifying what someone in a picture is feeling or guessing how a colleague might interpret a, a remark. The fact that people tend to mimic the expressions and body languages of their superiors can aggravate this problem. Subordinates provide free, few reliable cues to the powerful. But more important, Keltner says, is the fact that the powerful stop mimicking others. Laughing when others laugh or tensing when others tense does more than ingratiate. It helps trigger the same feelings those others are experiencing and provides a window into where they are coming from. Powerful people stop simulating the experience of others, Keltner says, which leads to what he calls an empathy de deficit. Mirroring is a subtler kind of mimicry that goes on entirely within our heads and without our awareness. When we watch someone perform an action, the part of the brain we would use to do that same thing lights up in sympathetic response. It might be best understood as vicarious experience. It's what Abhi and his team were trying to activate when they had their subjects watch a video of someone's hand squeezing a rubber ball. For non-powerful uh, participants, mirroring worked fine. The neural pathways that they would use to squeeze the ball themselves fired strongly. But the powerful groups? Less so. Was the mirroring response broken? More like anesthetized. None of the participants possessed permanent power. They were college students who had been primed to feel potent by recounting an experience in which they had been in charge. The anesthetic would presumably wear off when the feeling did. Their brains weren't structurally damaged after an afternoon in the lab. But if the effect had been long-lasting, say by a dint of having Wall Street analysts whispering their greatness quarter after quarter, board members offering them extra helpings of pay, and Forbes praising them for doing well while doing good, as I think Strumpf was, uh, they may have what in medicine is known as functional changes to the brain. And this is really dangerous because this, of course, you know, on, on the Wall Street level is one thing, but then you have people with, with real power, military power, like someone like the current crown prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, who, I mean, his complete and utter lack of, of empathy for the Yemenis next door has just been demonstrated time and time again over the last two years. Uh, I wondered whether the powerful might simply stop trying to put themselves in other shoes without losing the ability to do so. As it happened, Abhi ran a, subs a subsequent study sorry, that may help answer that question. This time, subjects were told what mirroring was and asked to make a con conscious effort to increase or decrease their response. Our results, he and his co-author Catherine Naish wrote, showed no difference. 
effort didn't help. This is a depressing finding. Knowledge is supposed to be power, but what good is knowing that power deprives you of knowledge? It's an interesting point. Uh, the sunniest possible spin, it seems, is that those changes are only sometimes harmful. Power, the research says, primes our brain to screen out peripheral information. In most situations, this provides a helpful efficiency boost. In social ones, it has the unfortunate side, side effect of making us more obtuse. Even that is not necessarily bad for the prospects of the powerful, and I would argue that that is completely untrue, or the groups they lead. As Susan Fisk, a Princeton psychology professor, has persuasively argued, power lessens the need for a nuanced read of people, since it gives us command of resources we once had to control from others, once again, I have a problem with this. But of course, in a modern organization, the maintenance of that command relies on some level of organizational support. And the sheer number of examples of executive hubris that bristle from the headlines suggests that many leaders cross the line into counterproductive folly. And I would say, not many, most. And uh, so if you want to read this article, you'll find a link to it below. I think it's really interesting to think that power actually more than just corrupting absolutely damages the functioning of your brain because human beings were not meant to live in such a hierarchical state one of my favorite thinkers murray bookchin um, i'll put a link to a video i put up here before of him talking about hierarchies and talking about how these hierarchies have actually led to human beings thinking that we can dominate nature itself and it's put us on a road towards runaway climate change and biodiversity loss that I talk about probably too much for some people in these videos but I mean we need to we need to start thinking about just even the way we organize ourselves you know even the way we organize our economy once again I think I'm repeating myself so anyway, I hope everyone out there has a great day, thinks about this idea of power, and also remembers that later on in the article they do talk about how by considering experiences, say you're a person who's in a management position, by thinking of experiences that you had where you were powerless, this can somehow um, counteract the effect of power corrupting your ability to empathize with others. It's super important for our time. So. Have a great day and thanks for watching and always remember